Brain Chip has officially reached the $1 mark. It's a milestone day, and of course, it's a significant step on the journey for ASXBRN. I thought it was as good of a time as any to spend some time reflecting, to have a think about the current state of play for where BRN's positioned, to actually talk about what a Keter is and why this neuromorphic processing technology is attracting such attention from the broader market. And then also to share some of the personal reflections on the journey it's been so far following the BrainChip story. A big congratulations to all of the longer term holders. It's a massive day. It's been a long time coming. I'm looking forward to seeing what's below the rest of this iceberg as the BRN commercialization story continues to grow. If you do enjoy this video, don't forget to hit the like button. Feel free to share it out. If you're new here, welcome. We make daily videos each and every day. So if you haven't yet, make sure you've subscribed. Turn your bell notifications on as well, and you won't miss any of our daily episodes. And so before unpacking what BrainChip's Akita technology actually is and why it's so exciting, and also discussing some other reflections, I thought it made sense for us to just to have a bit of this current state of play. Of course, we know 2021 was quite a formative year for the BrainChip story. The technology was developed, the R&D phase for this initial aspect of it has been completed, and BrainChip's really focusing on transitioning now towards this commercialization part of the process. Most recently, at the start of 2022, BRN hit the ground running, and this is the piece of news that really catalyzed a huge amount of interest in the ASX BRN story. Is that Mercedes-Benz at CES, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, huge show with a lot of eyes and a lot of attention from investors, from the retail community, from the tech crowd, all looking at this space. Mercedes announced that their Vision EQXX EV concept car would contain the Akita technology. And obviously there's further implications about Mercedes integrating Akita technology for further use cases, potentially in other types of products, other cars and other processes within the cars as well. And this has really attracted some significant eyes on it because of the validation that a huge global household name like Mercedes brings to the Akita technology. They're willing to use it. They see the benefit and the utility from this. And obviously as a result of that, there's a potential to flow through to other automotive manufacturers, but of course a range of different sectors and customers around the world as well. Well. Along with that, we know that in 2021, the Akita chips, the first set, AKD 1000, the first batch came off the line. The Akita development kits are now on sale. This provides the opportunity for BrainChip to engage with early access partners, with other potential enterprises or partners who want to get their hands on Akita, to test out Akita within their environments, to prototype some solutions, and see if Akita could be embedded within products. And this is what the development kits will be useful for. The IP licensing deals, we know that Mega Chips came to market in the back end of last year. Renassus as well is now live. So it'd be very fascinating to see, firstly, if we start to see Akita in more products coming out to market, but also the further opportunities for more commercial deals throughout 2022 and moving forward. We know the first agreement is often the hardest in the semiconductor space. You're waiting for that validation and for a customer to take that initial step, but then it can start to flow through pretty quickly as the snowball starts rolling downhill and you have the potential to see that hockey sticking of revenue if successful. And then I think an interesting one, we've talked about it a little bit on the channel too, is there's been an evident and a clear increased focus on investor relations and marketing efforts. BrainChip is really looking to bring the Akita technology and make this market globally. They're spreading the word, they're raising awareness, they know that this is a critical aspect of their growth journey, and they've been doubling down on their investment and the time they're spending in this, and it's really started to flow through, and obviously there's more eyes on the story as we are seeing. I'm keen to know your thoughts. It's a big day in the BRN story. Drop in a comment below what you think about this milestone and what do you think is up ahead for BrainChip in 2022? Before we dive in, as you guys know, I'm not a financial advisor. Nothing we discuss on the channel is financial advice. The stocks aren't by recommendations. These videos are all just a general discussion to be that starting spot for you to do your own research from. And so with that context and now understanding where BRN is currently positioned, I'm sure there's still people out there who are asking, what's a neuromorphic chip anyway? So I guess just to distill it down into what the Akita offering is and why it's attracting such interest, BrainChip's Akita technology helps to facilitate AI processing at the edge, and it leverages spiking neural networks to do that. If you think about processing in its current form, a lot of the incumbent technologies, a lot of the processing is done in the cloud, at data centers, in centralized locations, away from the device, away from the edge. Obviously, there's bandwidth concerns as a result of that. There's more devices start to come online. Obviously, it's going to use more and more bandwidth. You've got to think about your latency as a result. But we also know that Internet of Things technologies and more edge devices are coming online as the digital integration picks up pace. We know that from wearables to drones to electric vehicles, all of these have the potential to be 
three devices operating at the edge and the opportunity to process on these devices has the opportunity to add a lot of utility to these types of products. And so Akita helps to facilitate AI processing at the edge, but there are a range of other benefits as well that really help it to stand out. Firstly, Akita also has the ability to provide on-chip learning. Along with that as well, we've talked about the reduced focus on bandwidth and latency as it's processing away from the cloud and the data centers. But then also leveraging these spiking neural networks. Akita has ultra low power consumption. It's very energy efficient. So to understand SNNs or spiking neural networks, they're an event-based domain. So they're looking for anomalies, for spikes, rather than current technologies, which are processing all the time. They're consistently processing. And as a result of this, obviously they're going to be power hungry. So as a result of these spiking neural networks, Akita can be very, very energy efficient. And this has a huge amount of utility for a range of different products and sectors. And this is why Akita is attracting a lot of attention. Brainchips Akita has the ability to process across all of the five sensor modalities. As you can see here, this is another step change in comparison to many of the incumbent technologies. And Akita is product agnostic. So it could as easily go for a breathalyzer for the healthcare system to obviously potentially being in like consumer products like a fridge or a toaster or a kettle. Could end up in a Mercedes car or a myriad of other use cases from cybersecurity to drones, transport or anything else. And this is why there's so much investor interest not only on the ASX, but as well as globally about the potential for Brainchips Akita technology as it moves into this next stage of the commercialization process. And so now that we've talked about Brainchip and where it's currently positioned, I wanted to spend some time reflecting on Brainchip, I guess the investor sentiment towards the BRN story, and some of the opportunities that I personally have had for learnings and developing my understanding about the market by observing the Brainchip journey over this past period. I think to do that, a couple of definitions probably come to mind to help us paint this picture. The first one is cognitive diversity. You might have heard of the phrase before, we know that cognitive, cognitive diversity is often discussed in a workplace or a team setting. It's really the inclusion of a variety of people or discussions with alternative thought patterns, ideas, problem solving met methods and mental perspectives. We know that we live in a diverse world, we know that diverse opinions and thoughts are better to help us come to greater conclusions, more rich conclusions, and they help us factor in a much broader understanding than the types of conclusions that we can come to ourselves. Obviously, we all know about the benefit and the opportunity that cognitive diversity can provide for us in a team setting, whether it's with community groups we're involved in, at workplaces or sports teams. I'm sure we can all think about teams that we're involved in that are diverse. We've seen that the sum of the parts is much better than the individual thoughts that we can provide. But cognitive diversity is also an important understanding or framework that we can use to layer on top of our investing mindset. The richer the experiences, the broader the breadth of experiences and situations that we can draw from, the richer our individual analysis will be. The different tools and tools that we have within our toolkit that we can use means that we can have a much broader breadth of analysis. If we're always just trying to fit in a square peg into a circle hole and we're trying to analyze companies in the resources, the biotech, the retail sector, the same as we'll analyze companies in the technology sector, just using maybe some conventional valuation metrics, only using price to sales or only just looking at top line revenue growth or maybe we might be missing out on some different types of opportunities or some intangible factors that we might need to consider to give us a really holistic understanding of what we're looking at and then I think building on that as well learning we all know about what learning is conceptually it's just simply the acquisition of whether it's knowledge skills attitudes or behaviors that integrate with who we are as people through study experience or being taught we can acquire learning through a range of different factors we all learn differently i think we all understand that fact but what i do want to discuss is how important learning is when we approach the markets so i think too many people just focus on being right on the markets. The only thing they want to do is if they see green, they must have been successful with their pursuit on the markets. If they see red, oh, they must have got it wrong. But actually, I think if we pursue learning as really the core pillar of everything that we're doing on the markets, well, eventually the results will take care of themselves. And so now with that initial discussion, we can bring it all together and wrap it up and discuss what that actually means for markets. I think first and foremost, it's just an understanding that nobody knows who's right or wrong. You only have to look at the current setting in terms of the inflation narrative. You've got some steadfast believers that inflation is permanently embedded. We're about to move into a hyperinflation environment. Central banks have moved too late and they've caused irreparable damage to the economy. While others are still stating that, hey, it's probably transitory. Supply chain bottlenecks are going to fade. Economic recovery is on track and this is exactly where we want to be. And the smartest minds, many economists, many analysts are out there. And there's so many different people sitting on different parts of the spectrum. And so if you have so many smart people who can't even 
come to a consensus on those types of discussions, of course, on all of the different facets of the market, there's going to be convergent opinions. And that's fine. That's actually what makes a market. There's no rights or wrongs. Everyone's got different opinions. There'll be buyers, there'll be sellers on any side of the coin. Look at the GDP forecast for 2022. Look at the index forecast for 2022. There's a huge amount of divergence there. But I think it's important to understand that everything is a balance of probabilities on the market. However, the probabilities that we attribute to individual scenarios are going to be different for each of us as individuals. And these are weighted by our worldviews, which are developed. There is, of course, significant limitations if we just view the world in different perspectives or settings or scenarios with a homogenous mindset. There's the opportunity to be successful from that. But I think the breadth of analysis and the richness of analysis comes from understanding a range of different people, a range of different scenarios and a range of different things. And that's what's really important and what we really should continue to focus on. We can't read every book. We can't listen to every podcast. We can't watch every video out there. So the easiest way to shortcut that and to build up our understanding is to talk to others who have. There are going to be people who understand different sectors of the market more than we do. There'll be people who have different valuations models to us. There'll be people who have different types of understandings about companies in different stages of their growth cycle. It's such a benefit for us to be able to have discussions in good faith, effective discourses, and not to shut each other down and to try and bring each other down because they have different types of mindsets. But it's really about having these great discussions and being able to develop together and grow Grow this understanding. The markets are never about who's right or wrong. As mentioned earlier, it should always be about facilitating our own learning, which ultimately will flow through to our results and growth. And I think it's worth noting too that the more complex the sphere, the more complex the sector, the more of a refined understanding that you need, the more nuanced the discussions will be. Of course, Brainship is playing the deep technology space. It's been a polarizing company. There's had quite a divergence in terms of views about Brainship. And I think this comes from the atypical growth trajectory that it's taken. It's grown much more like a US technology company than it has compared to many of the conventional ASX technology names. And as a result of that, I think people have had divergence opinions but I think what we really need to remember is often we fear what we don't understand. There's nothing wrong with things being different to the status quo or being different to what we are used to. But just because something's different doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just means that maybe we don't have the understanding of it. So I think it's always worth developing our toolkits, continuing to develop our understanding and being willing to think outside the box and to acknowledge that we all have different worldviews. There is no right or wrong, but the opportunity to learn about different companies, to explore different sectors, to understand the human psychology of the markets, the politics, the economics. It's one of the greatest opportunities to continue to learn as a community. And I think this is what's really exciting about the markets. And heck, it's the reason why we all keep coming back to continue to grow. And so nobody knows what the future has in store. We can't say with any certainty what will happen next year, next week, or even tomorrow. But I think that milestones are as good of a time as any to just reflect and to use the past experiences that we've had to really help to develop and continue to evolve our investing strategies. Before we dive into some of these final reflections and thinking about where Brainship might head from here moving forward, if you have enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button. Feel free to share it out. If you're new here, make sure you've subscribed and turned your bell notifications on and drop in a comment your thoughts on BRN achieving this $1 milestone. Whenever I think about the way that I perceive the markets and how I try to approach it, I'm always drawn back to that Socrates quote, the great thinker stated, the only thing that we know with any certainty is that we know nothing. I think approaching the market with the perspective of always learning, a willingness to grow, a willingness to be wrong, and to also take in a breadth of different types of inputs and data sources. I think so many people approach different types of companies and sectors that they might not be familiar with, with the focus that, hey, if I don't understand it, or if I haven't seen this before, it must be wrong. There's a range of different scenarios we find ourselves on the market. We can't keep using the same one spanner, the same one valuation model, the same one perspective to value different companies in different types of sectors. And so I think having this cognitive diversity and a willingness to learn and grow is what's going to enable us and facilitate our growth most effectively. And if we're not willing to engage into these types of discussions, if we're not willing to think about things from a different type of lens or to understand things from different people's perspectives, we're only really robbing ourselves of that opportunity to grow. We don't know where Brainship will be tomorrow. It could be 50 cents. It could be $1.50. It's still in the early stages. It's still developing. But what they have is a top of class, the world's first and currently only commercially available neuromorphic processor. They've got a team with a breadth of experience and a true understanding about how to evolve. And now they've got a growing client base who are starting to really pay attention to Akita. That's drawing a lot of eyes onto the opportunity. 
And so for the longer term investors, I don't think too much really changes. There'll still be plenty of dot joining, plenty of thoughts about where Akita might find itself next. But I think most importantly, a willingness to be patient with the knowledge that it takes a long time to become an overnight success. People might be starting to look at Brainship now as BRN got onto more radars and thinking, hey, where did Brainship come from? It looks like it's just emerged and shot out of nowhere. But for those who have been following the journey, they know that this has been built over a long period of time, from concept through to R&D to now silicon and now focusing on the commercialization stage of this strategy. So to the longer term investors on a milestone day like today, congratulations. It hasn't been a straight linear line. There's been twists there's been turns but it really has been a fascinating journey and it's exciting to see where the bus will head from here and i wanted to extend an individual thank you as well to the hot copper community it is a true breadth of knowledge i have personally learned a lot about brain chip akita the technology side of things but also more broadly about the semiconductor space so a big thank you to everyone who's been so willing to share their time their knowledge and their research so freely it's been an incredible knowledge base and i truly am grateful for that and finally, to the Brainship team, congratulations. It's a milestone day, but it truly does look like it's just the tip of the iceberg. So everyone's excited to see what lays below and what's up ahead on this bus journey ahead. Thank you to, for providing us with this opportunity to invest in something that could be potentially the future of technology and edge computing. It's such a fascinating story. Thank you so much for joining us. Akita Ballista, hope you enjoyed the video. For now, stay well and happy investing.